a fun question. <laughs> if you, or just imagine, because this isn't going to happen, sorry. But imagine if you walked in here today and we announced that you, in fact, had won the Florida Powerball and you were the proud new owner of $150 million. You'd be more excited than that, I promise. That was, all right, got my work cut out for me. But here's the question. What would you do? What would you do? Probably immediately you've got three or four things <laughs> that you know right away I would do this. Maybe you'd quit your job like be before tomorrow. Like you'd send that email. You'd stop listening to me and you'd email your rotten boss. You're like, I'm out. Got more money than you, bro. I'm out. Maybe you would just go on vacation. Maybe you just go on vacation, schedule a trip. I know what some of you would do. Some of you would stay in your pajamas for six months. Get a few amens. Some of you are just lying. Maybe you'd buy an island and run away. Just escape. Just escape. We're in a series called Unhurried, and we're looking at the pace of our life, right? We're looking at the pace of our life and really how that squares with what Jesus and his concerns were for us. Because Jesus said in Luke 21, 34, and this is where we started two weeks ago, but Jesus said in Luke 21, 34, to be careful Right? That's, a, that's a specific instruction for us, that we, we need to be careful about something. Like, think about that. Like when, I, when you tell your kids, or maybe you have ever babysat for somebody, or you have little cousins, or we've all been around kids, right? And so if we tell a kid, like, you need to be careful, like we're we're expecting a certain emotion to fill that kid, right? We, we want their feelings to match our feelings, don't we? Right? Like, we get in there with that, with that kid, like, who's about to cross the street, and we get down there and we say, you need to be careful. Because why? Because that child can't totally grasp the dire situation that they're in, right? They just want the ball. <laughs> they just want what they want. But if a car comes around the corner, we all know the problem, right? So we get, we get down there with that kid and we say, you need to be careful. So Jesus here is saying, be careful. Here's why. And stay with me. Be careful or, so there's an either or, right? If you're not careful, this will happen. If you are careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. Now we hear carousing and drunkenness and we think like, yeah, those bad people. But think about it. Carousing is... Simply the lusts of the flesh, the entertainment of life. Drunkenness could stand for anything that is Lord in your life that doesn't have the name Jesus Christ, right? Because what does the scripture say? Be filled with the spirit, right? So drunkenness is simply anything that's causing you to not be filled with the Spirit. And then the anxieties of life, I don't, probably don't need to explain that to you. <laughs> so we all deal with that. And then he, then he throws this out. He says, because that day will close on you, if you're not careful, will close on you like a trap. In other words, 
put it simply, our pursuits of power, pleasure, and fame, and fortune suddenly lead to the stark reality that we have lost time. Think about that, because think about the intentional language that Jesus chose. If you're not careful, you'll suddenly be trapped without the ability to go back. And it resonates with us, because we all know what it's like to lose time, don't we? When we lose somebody we love, we say, well, I just wish I had a little bit more time. So as you're thinking about that, I want to I read to you from an author. His name is Andrew Root, and he writes, he writes this, and this quote will be on the screen for you. He writes this, we have all, so, so why did I start with money and get into time? Here we go. We have all sorts of dreams about money, right? If you won the Powerball, we've all got four things. We're ready to roll, ready to put that plan in motion. We have all sorts of dreams about money because we assume it's the path to give us back time. We wonder, even count, how much money it would take to release us from the acceleration of time. We sense that the only way to live a good life is to live a fast life, a life that keeps pace with all the change and opportunity in front of us. Now, I want to leave that quote up there, Jordan, for a minute, because I want to read to you the rest of that section from his book. And now bear with me, it's a, it's a, it's a section, okay, I'm asking for... A little more than your YouTube attention span here, okay? So if you're on YouTube, you're doubly, you're doubly going to be struggling, all right? But I want you to track with me, okay? With that in mind, all right? This connection that we feel between money and time, okay? Here's what he continues. Even if you won the lottery and built a fort out of the 50s dollar bills, even if it were possible to use the money to unplug, somehow constraining the structural realities of acceleration, the human need for a good life would get to you. And you would be ensnared by the many ways that the modern sense of the good life is tied to speed. After binging your eighth season of The Bachelor, you'd start to feel it. Guilt would creep in, and you'd wonder, maybe it isn't right for me to unplug like this. Maybe this is a waste of time. Right then, the need to catch up would call for you. You'd think, maybe I should take advantage of this time (laughs) and watch something enriching like The Wire or BBC World News, or better yet, order Rosetta Stone and learn Spanish. Actually, eating those bonbons hasn't been good for my figure, so I should work out. But first, I should research the best workout, and when I get in shape, I'll need to keep up with the workouts or I'll fall behind and gain weight again. That would make me feel guilty. After losing the weight, I'll take pride in how I've remade myself out of, an- out of the ambition of myself. But regaining the weight, I feel so guilty not so much to the scale, but to the sense of self that I wish that I possess and present. Even if I maintain my figure, I don't want to be a dull person. I should read all the Tolstoy novels I never read. Maybe finally get through David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest. Right now, I don't have the time. I need to get to the gym. But I'll buy those books I'll put them on myself so others can see that I'm the kind of person that purchases good literature. (laughs) But that good feeling will be interrupted by guilt because I've never had the time to read them. The guilt will be more intense than just a sense of wasting money. It will feel like hypocrisy in my own being, a violation to myself. I present that I'm a deep person who likes classic lit. That's the self I'm curating, 
But honestly, I've never had the time to read, faking that I know the references. My desire to be a certain kind of self and my inability to keep up the pace that this self demands condemns me. But there's even more that condemns me. This is why I said you got to stay with me. But there's even more that condemns me because I'm describing your life if you haven't figured that out. There's more that condemns me. I've never been able to get to those books, never past Wallace's first chapter, because I've wanted to be the kind of person who's informed, who knows what's going on in the world. I've never read Tolstoy because I need to read the New York Times or even just the articles on my Facebook feed. But I couldn't even keep up with the Times or Facebook, though the articles are less exhausting and time-consuming than Tolstoy. I was too drained. My friends keep posting Atlantic articles, and I can't get through the Times, let alone the Atlantic. I feel guilty that I'm not like them, the kind of self who reads and posts Atlantic articles. At least Facebook has connected me with my old friends. Yet I feel so guilty that I've lost touch with so many of those friends over the years. Now these people, through social media, rush back into my life like a flood. I soon realize that through social media... I have access, but not the time, to keep up with the hundreds and even thousands of my friends over the years, which condemns me even further. I feel particularly guilty that I'm not the self I wish I were. When a coworker asks, have you been following X, Y, or Z, they mean it as a line of conversation, but I first hear it as condemnation. I haven't. I haven't had time to keep up on the election fraud in Wisconsin or environmental corruption in North, Car- in North California. I could be following these current events, but instead I need to read more parenting books. My kids are growing up so fast. <laughs> I'm barely hanging on. I'm not being the parent they need. The self I want to be is a good, informed, and diligent parent. Plus, those books can be read fast. The pages turn so much more quickly than Wallace and his footnotes, way less taxing than an Atlantic article. I can actually feel good about getting a whole book finished, picking up helpful tips, not getting left behind in parenting, maybe even being more intentional. I'm now able to ask another parent, have you read? (laughs) Shifting the guilt off of me and onto them. But truth be told, these parenting books and their fast accessibility thrust me into more guilt. They provide me strategies to speed up and be a good parent reminding me that I'm not a good parent. And if I'm not conscious and available at all moments with my kids, I'll lose those moments, never getting them back. I'm guilty both for not being the parent I wish I were and worse, for falling behind time itself. I was supposed to accomplish eight things before my daughter was five. Now she's nine and there are eight more tasks. And then here's the last part says, unable to keep up with these parenting books, conferences, and podcasts, I'll release my guilt by following the blog of an irreverent writer. <laughs> She'll post hilarious anecdotes of all her parenting fails, telling her readers to relax. She whimsically reminds her readers that all of us ruin birthday cakes and get drunk at parties for four-year-olds. At one level, reading these posts assuages my guilt, which is why such irreverent bloggers and podcasters are multiplying. But at another level, they too just make me feel more guilt. These irreverent bloggers seem to make even their failures cool, witty, and authentic. They present such interesting selves with such clever references and hip headshots. I'm sure I could never be this kind of cool person. I doubt I'm this talented, even if they are just like me. Plus, I'll never have the time to try anyhow. That was long, but it needed to be long to prove the point that if I was to just take those details out and put your details in, it would probably describe your life. Because what's the first thing that somebody says every time I say, hey, how you doing? They say, oh, I'm good, but I'm busy. Why? Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, why am I so busy? busy. Think about it. Think about it. If you're taking notes today, I want you to write down my sermon title because I think it'll speak to you. I want you to write this down. Lost in time with all the guilt. 
lost in time with all the guilt. Because here's what I think is happening. I think our modern times have attempted to flatten morality, individualize it, remove the complexity of life, right? You do you, and then celebrate me doing me. And yet, even when it comes to being our authentic self, which is what real freedom is, we're told, we cannot escape the morality of time. I read you all of that because you can't actually be all of that. Our guilt will condemn us. The good life that we're seeking is inextricably tied to time and to our morality. We don't even have time to do me, let alone celebrate you and keep up with society and all of the things that they say we're supposed to be. This is why Christianity then in Scripture is not presented to us as a list of things to do, but rather it's presented to us as news. Think about that. It's news and it's good news. Strategically important for you to understand that what God came and delivered was news, not morality. God is not sitting in the sky somewhere, watching what you do, ready with lightning bolts to throw over the side rail of heaven into your life. Christianity is relational. Because here's what Jesus said in Luke 10, 27. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. He said that that's the whole thing. It's relationship. Love the Lord your God with everything that you are. Then turn and love your neighbor as yourself. It's really interesting because when you go to the Bible and you look for somebody who might fit where we find ourselves in this cultural moment, I couldn't help but be drawn to Mark chapter 10. If you have a Bible, you can meet me there. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 17. And it's a familiar story if you've been around church at all. It's the story of the rich young ruler. It's the story of the rich young ruler. And um, it's such an interesting story because he's disheartened by many of the things that, if we're honest, we're disheartened by. And so I want to read it in Mark chapter 10. Would you stand with me as we read the Bible? Worship is a participatory sport. And so it'll be on the screen for you if you need it. Otherwise, you can follow in your Bible. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 says this. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. No one is good except God alone. And then Jesus meets him where he's at. Verse 19. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. In other words, Jesus, I've done the list. I've done the things I'm supposed to do. And yet here he is standing before Jesus asking what he needs to do, right? I've done all the things. I'm working real hard. But it hasn't assuaged the guilt that I've lost the race of time. 
The next statement is so powerful. And I want you to feel the weight of its power. Because of all the things that Jesus could have felt in that next moment, I want you to see what he felt. It says, Jesus looked at him in verse 21 and what? Loved him. Jesus looked at him and loved him. It's powerful. And then here's what Jesus said. One thing you lack. Go sell everything you have. Think about that. Sell everything you have. And give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. I want you to put yourself in that place. Because I think, and I know most of you, I think all of us would want to say, I am willing to sell everything I have and then follow Jesus. But can we be real today? Isn't, isn't there this one thing we lack? I'm not asking you to sell everything you have today. I'm not Jesus. <laughs> but I am asking you to go there and ask yourself, am I in this place with this young man? Because look at verse 22. It says, at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, probably depressed like you and I feel right now. But Jesus said again, okay, and here we're again. Remember, Jesus looked at him and loved him. So he didn't say that to drive him away. Look at this. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, then who can be saved? Right? Like that's the question then. Who, then, then who of us is going to make it? And then Jesus declares this news that I was referencing before. Jesus looked at them, verse 27, and said, With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And then Peter speaks up. Shocking. We have left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecution. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last. First, you can be seated. Jesus loved him. Jesus loved him so much that he had to tear down this man's idol of performance. He had to make it plain, right? Because we're, we're usually drawn into the money here, that he was sad and walked away because he had great wealth. But that wasn't the question, right? Deeper in than just having the money was he wanted to know what he had to do to get eternal life. And what Jesus moved in to tell him was that there's, there's nothing you can do. You see, because for every single one of us in this place right now, watching online, listening on YouTube later, downloading a podcast. It doesn't matter who you are. There's something that if the Holy Spirit of God stepped up into your mind and said, I want you to give up that. Every single one of us, our head would fall. Our head would fall. 
because we're human. And humans cannot manufacture eternal life. So incredibly important. Because what I'm not asking you to do in this series called Unhurried is stop working or stop doing or stop following. No, Jesus still says, you, there is something you should do and then you should follow me. But what he's driving at is this young man cannot do that on his own. It's actually interesting. Several of the early church fathers, like back in the 200s, like very close to Jesus, wrote pretty extensively about this rich young ruler and really how we tend to read it wrong, even only 100 years later. They were already tending to read that about money. But listen to what Clement of Alexandria said, and we'll put it on the screen for you so that you can follow along. But he was a North African church father, okay? And and he argued that we tend to read this wrong, that we tend to dismiss the guy because of his money. And then in reality, that wealth is not actually the problem. Because here's what Clement of Alexandria said. If one is able in the midst of wealth, See, because the, the view even early on was that we all have wealth. Like if, if our needs are met and we have family and we have the things that are around us, if we have the church community, we are wealthy. If one is able in the midst of wealth to turn from its mystique, to entertain moderate desires, to el- exercise self-control, to seek God alone, and then listen to this. We're going to come back to this later. And to breathe God and walk with God. That's powerful. Such a man submits to the commandments. Isn't that interesting? Just surrender and you've submitted to the commandments. Listen to this. Being free, unsubdued, free of disease, what a, what a statement this is. Unwounded by wealth. It's powerful. That's a word for us today as much as it was back then. Unwounded by wealth. Because what was Jesus after here? Was he after this man's money? Or was he after this man's heart? It's after his heart. It's after his heart because maybe you're... Maybe you're listening to me two weeks ago, Jerome, last week, and you're sitting here today and you're thinking about your life and you're listening to me tell you that your pace of life is too much, that you can't actually do all the things, that you're going to have that moment where you are sad and have to walk away. Maybe you're hearing that and it's disheartening to you. And there's a very good chance that it is as you look at your life. Because in some ways, it feels like an assault on what you've built. Right? It does. Because some of you, a lot of you, are really successful. You've accomplished something in life. And so what I'm pushing you towards is not to stop working. Because that would be anti-biblical, right? Because what, is, what does Paul tell us and his friends in Ephesus, in Ephesians? It says, no, no, no. You were created in Christ for what? Good works. So we're not anti-work here. But to stop and abide in Christ, to sit there, and meditate on his word, and pray and listen, like Jerome suggested last week, in your day-to-day life, honestly, is going to feel like a waste of time. Why? Because the results, the fruit, does not come in our timeline. It comes in his. Right? Because it's in John 15 where it says, Abide in me and I in you, and you will bear how much fruit? Much fruit, Jesus says. But then we go, we sit down with our Bible, 
and we start thinking about everything but the Bible. (laughs) There were other early church fathers who talked about that, and they would say, just let them float on by. Just let them go. Have them come, and then let them go. Because we can't help it. We're inextricably tied to time and guilt. Because I think we're victims of immediacy, right? Everything needs to happen now. And so this idea that I would stop when all these things are over here, still bidding for my time, and I've got things to do, and places to be, and people to talk to, and I've got to get this done, and I've got to stay up with the times, and it just, it's always what? It's always ticking. It's always bidding. It's always wanting. We've been told and sold that time is money. And it is. We're victims, and I say victims intentionally of immediacy. I'll say it to you this way we've traded in grandma's home cooking for microwavable meals. We have. And so I love what Craig Groeschel says about leadership. He says that leaders. I think this will be on the screen too. Leaders do consistently what others do occasionally. Leaders do consistently what others do occasionally. Okay? So what does that mean? If you want to see the fruit of the Spirit in your life, you cannot do occasionally what God has asked you to do consistently. Somebody should write that down. Because here's the thing, you know that, but are you willing to, come on, do that? Inner peace and joy don't come out of the microwave. They don't. They do not come out of the microwave. They are forged in the open flames of the brick oven of relationships with God and with your neighbor. Look around. These are your neighbors. There's a few online. (laughs) There's no shortcut. There's no microwavable knockoff. We gather corporately like this every single Sunday for our entire life. Listen, when I don't look like this and I look old, I'm going to show up and I'm going to still be here Because we do consistently what God has asked us to do consistently and not occasionally. Hebrews is still in the Bible. Hebrews says that God's people get together. It's not an option because there's no microwavable shortcut to the promises and blessings of God. There's not. Because what did Jesus say? How difficult it is for those of us who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because we've got things to do, man. We've got stuff to do. We don't got time for that. There's no substitute. To sell it short is to instead be discipled by the world and its system and its values. Of which, by the way, we're, we're all... We, are, we all have that, what uh, Francis Schaeffer called the dust of death. We all have that dust of death on us. Like, you can't get out of that because you're in the world. And so, how difficult, but there's good news, right? Th- this, this was one of the rallying cries of the Reformation 500 years ago, right? There was a Latin phrase, and I think we have it that you can see it on the screen here, called post tenebris lux. And it means after darkness, light. That is the gospel. How difficult it is for you in this culture to enter the kingdom of God. You just need to know that. You need to know that tomorrow, all those things are going to come bidding for your soul every single day. And some of them you have to do because the Bible also says in Proverbs somewhere that if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an infidel. I don't want to be an infidel. 
I'm going to provide for my family. So again, it's, it's not about what you're doing. It's about the pace at which you're doing it. Because if you can't slow down to the pace of relationships, you're missing what God has offered to you. But after Jesus declared how difficult it was for people to enter the kingdom of God, what did he say? He didn't just leave you there. After you feel that, what did he say? With man, that is impossible. (laughs) Because you might be looking around going, I don't know what I'm supposed to let go of. Me neither. But with God, all things are possible. Here's the reality. Peace and joy are found in the crucible of surrender. Not my will, but yours. Laying my life down for the sake of yours. To do this, we have to slow down to the pace of love. Jesus had plenty to do. He was God. He had sermons to preach, bread to multiply, people to heal, lessons to teach his disciples, friends to visit, temples to cleanse, prayers to pray, crosses to carry. But in that moment, what does it say? That Jesus slowed down to the pace of love and it says Jesus what? Loved him. This was one person who wanted a quick fix and Jesus loved him enough to not give it to him. Slowed down to the pace of love. He loved him. Simple and profound. The speed of love. There's another early church father named Jerome. Not to be confused with our Jerome who was in Africa where this guy was from. <laughs> he lived in the, early, in the late 300s and was really a giant in Bible translation. He wrote what we know as the Latin Vulgate and then ultimately translated into um, the King James Version and was really a, a critical part of us getting the English Bible. But here's what he said about the rich young ruler. He said what he, Jesus, this will be on the screen too. Um, What he, Jesus, means is, I do not compel you. I do not command you. But I set in front of you the palm of victory. I show you the prize. It is for you to decide whether you will enter the arena and win the crown. The work is done. Think about that. The work is done. It is set before you. Will you receive it is the question. Will you receive it? I've given you a lot of theoretical things. I want to give you three ways that you can structure your life this week that will actually help you. Structure, let me me say it to you this way. I want to encourage you to structure your day into three movements. I don't want you to change your day. You have your day and there's a reason you have your day. I want to encourage you to change the pace of your mind as you move through your day and do it in this way. Three movements for your day. Number one, intimacy with God. Intimacy. Begin your day in the morning, positioning yourself into your relationship with God. Depending on what your day looks like, this will look different. Some of you, it's going to look like coffee and Bible and slowly meditating and listening. Some of you have these things called children, and that's not going to happen. So it's going to look differently for you. It's going to look like locking the door to your bathroom while you get ready and your kids pound on it and scream. Guess what? They're going to live through that experience. I promise you. I've tried it. Okay? And you just turn your worship music up a little bit louder and you praise Jesus in in the midst of the storm. Amen? They'll be fine. 
Every now and then you just pause it and you go, brush your teeth, <laughs> right? Change your clothes. I'm leaving in five minutes. This is good parenting. <laughs> let, let, me, let me even help you with, okay, I say read your Bible, right? Like even that can seem like a daunting thing. If you have a little bit of time, download the YouVersion Bible app and every day there's a verse of the day. Take the decision making out of it. Don't add another decision to your plate. Read that one verse and meditate on it. Listen to it. What is Jesus saying in this verse? That doesn't take any time. In fact, it can go with you. I don't know if you know, but we've got these things. They go everywhere. (laughs) Take it with you. Screenshot that verse. Set it as the wallpaper of your phone. So every time you touch it, you see it. This is structuring the day you're already doing to position it inside of the life of Jesus. Because John 15, 4 says, remain in me. Think about that. As I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So what does it look like to remain in Jesus? Take him. Take him with you. He's already there. Pay attention to him. Talk to him. Read his word. Meditate on it. I think we think of meditating as only sitting down in one spot with no distractions ever for hours and hours and hours. You can take Jesus with you. And I would encourage you to do that. Intimacy with God. Now, do I think you need to get to the place where you have real relational time with him? Yes. But God's after your heart. And so there will be seasons that look different from other seasons. I do think that you need to figure out how to slow your life down and create time and space for Jesus. But you got to start somewhere. If you have a little more time, still take the decision-making out of it. Find, find a lectionary online and just read the verses that are there. Take, take the decision-making out of it. Number two, so we have intimacy with God. The second movement of your day is interaction with God. Start to look and notice where you are already moving at where God's moving. God has brought me down this path today. Where's he participating in the world in this path? Because where Pastor Mitch goes on Tuesday is going to be different than you. But God has sent every one of his kids into the hedges and highways to compel people to come in so that his house might be full, right? So every one of us in every spot we go is supposed to be on mission for God. But you won't do that if you're not interacting with him. Work, home, shopping, surfing, thinking. How can I join him where he already is? Simple ways, small ways, relational ways is where Jesus is. Simply be aware that he is everywhere. Listen to Psalm 139, 7 to 12. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn or I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. No matter where you go, He is there. No matter where you go, he is there. What I think the second movement of your day is after you've engaged in an intimate relationship with him and you invite him on the journey with you where he already is, you simply notice where he's already working. Join him. Third one, intercession with God. Intercession with God. End your day in prayer. I mean like old school prayer, like prayer list prayer, like leave it on your nightstand prayer list prayer. Expecting God to hear 
and answer your prayers, to confess your sins, and then receive his grace and forgiveness. You need that every day of your life. Every single day. Hebrews 4.16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So we come full circle. It ain't the Powerball that you need, right? You don't need a bunch more money to fix the guilt that you feel in the loss of your time. That's not what you need. You don't need money to slow down or speed up the pace of life. Christ, the peaceful presence of Jesus in the Holy Spirit, in your life, every day, day in and day out, and day in and day out, will bring you the peace that passes all understanding. No need to get lost in time with all your guilt. Simply stop and rest. Everybody else will make it. Who needs you right now? We come back to this place where Clement of Alexandria brought us. Make some time to breathe in your God. To breathe in your God. And I actually want to do that now. I want to create that space for just a couple minutes before we let you go. So I'm going to have the band come up and I'm going to want them to play here in a second. And I just want you to sit there. I just want you to sit there and do nothing. Kevin's going to sing over us this idea that God is a way maker. Do you ever think about why we sing that? Because there are things in your life that you don't know how to make a way for it. Provisions that you need, miracles that you need, prayers answered that you need, and you can fill it in health things that you need. You, you can fill that in. But what we need is to breathe in our God. To be in relationship with the only one who can actually make a difference in every sphere of your life. But so many of us are too busy for Jesus. Jesus. And so shame on us if we can't gather as his body and make time for you to be in touch with Jesus. Amen? So Kevin's going to play for a minute here and then uh, he'll sing that over us and then in a minute he'll invite you to stand and sing with him. So in this moment while he's singing, I just, I want you to unhurry yourself. For some of you, that's going to feel so weird. <laughs> Good. Embrace that. Think about those three movements of your day and how you might join God in the renewal of all things. Because he's in the business of bringing dead things to life. So let's take even just these few minutes together to listen and to be with and breathe in our God.